Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Sergeant First Class Anthony Hewitt from the Department of Army Public Affairs. Today, we'll discuss retired Colonel Ralph Puckett Jr.'s heroic actions at Hill 205 in the vicinity of Unsan, Korea, November 25th and 26th, 1950. When then First Lieutenant Puckett served as an infantryman and company commander of the 8th Army Ranger Company, he led his rangers in a daylight attack to secure Hill 205. While his men were pinned down under enemy machine gun fire, mortar fire, and small arms fire, he ran across an open field three times to draw the enemy fire away from his men. His actions allowed the rangers to locate and destroy the enemy machine gun position, enabling the company to seize Hill 205. Colonel Puckett is, a historic, is part of a historic generation of our nation's history and joined the Army out of a sense of patriotism, patriotism duty, pride, and, a, and to make his parents proud. Being there and being better every day for the soldiers and families is a mantra Colonel Puckett lives by each and every day. His wife, Jeannie, a proud, a proud Army spouse, of 68 years. They have two daughters, one of, one of whom is deceased, a son, and six grandchildren. Colonel Puckett deployed in support of the Korean and Vietnam Wars. After 22 years of service to our country, he retired in 1971. He has been an active pillar in the Army and Ranger community, mentoring soldiers for the last 40 years. He has a deep connection to the community of Columbus, Georgia, and Fort Benning. Before I go over the ground rules of the Media Roundtable, please allow me to introduce you to the panel. With us today are retire is retired Army Colonel John Locke, a longtime friend of the family and one who advocated for Colonel Puckett's Distinguished Service Cross upgrade for the last 19 years. Colonel Puckett's son, Thomas Puckett, Retired Colonel Ralph Puckett, Jr. Retired Army Master Sergeant Merle Simpson, a lifelong friend of Colonel Puckett's and a fellow Ranger at Hill 205. Retired Army Colonel Robert Chapa, a longtime friend and president of the National Infantry Association. Today's media roundtable will last 35 minutes, ending no later than 4.35. Colonel Locke will be providing opening remarks. We will then begin taking your questions. For the Q&A segment, when called upon, please provide your name and affiliation and limit yourself to one question and a follow-up. I will provide a notice when we have time for one last question. So thank you for joining us today. At this time, I'd like to introduce John Locke. John, over to you for opening remarks. Thank you very much. Sergeant First Class Hewitt, good afternoon. On behalf of Team Puckett and the intrepid rangers of the 8th Army Ranger Company, as represented by Master Sergeant Merle Simpson, I would like to thank you for joining us today. As we are all aware, the Medal of Honor is the nation's highest award for military valor. The Congressional Medal of Honor Society notes that each medal tells a story of its own, and the story of Colonel Puckett is certainly no exception. Tomorrow, during the award ceremony at the White House, President Joe Biden will describe in detail the battlefield courage of Colonel Ralph Puckett, Jr. and his fellow Rangers, of how on a desolate hilltop deep within North Korea and only 60 miles from the border of China, his already battle-weary Rangers prepared defenses as the weather grew harsher and a piercing wind pushed the chill factor well below zero degrees, of how with no fire, no warm food, no cold weather gear, no sleeping bags, and the unnerving sound of firefights in the distance as enemy forces overwhelmed friendly units in the dark. The Rangers waited in misery, their turn to face a similar onslaught against the overwhelming odds of a fanatical enemy. However, the President's description of the nearly insurmountable requirements that define a Medal of Honor recipient will only be part of the compelling story of Colonel Ralph Puckett, Jr., who has had a life of service to the nation both in and out of uniform. In reality and upon reflection, the story of Battle Hill 205 and the story of Colonel Puckett extend well beyond the singular Medal of Honor event that spanned the 25th and early morning hours of the 26th of November 1950. 
The Battle of Hill 205 was a culmination of a series of events that were initiated with Lieutenant Bucket's selection to lead the newly formed Ranger Company. Personally choosing his soldiers from among non-combatant clerks, cooks, drivers, and mechanics, Lieutenant Puckett conceived of and implemented a standard and training regiment that was able to literally forge his rangers into, forge his men into rangers within five and a half weeks. It is a standard still emulated today by the elite U.S. Army Ranger School. The day prior to the Battle Hill 205, Lieutenant Puckett and his rangers assaulted another hill, Hill 224, suffering killed and wounded from both enemy and friendly fires. That night they dug foxholes into the hill's frozen ground. With no sleeping bags, they endured near zero temperatures, fought hypothermia, and suffered sleep deprivation. Just how cold was it, you ask? So cold that the rangers took turns tucking their bare feet into their buddies' armpits to fight off frostbite, fulfilling the light infantry axiom of travel light freeze at night. That was the prelude to the Battle of Hill 205. A company of rangers built from scratch and manned by non-infantry, non-combat experienced soldiers led by an inexperienced junior lieutenant. It was a unit that had already suffered the deprivation of hardship and battle before the day and night that would come to define them. Yet within this short amount of time, under the most adverse of conditions, Lieutenant Puckett had inculcated within each of his men a faith in each other. Army Rangers are a unique and elite warfighter who live in accordance with what is called the Ranger Creed. Among the principles of the Creed are, never shall I fail my comrades, and I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. The rangers who disobeyed Lieutenant Puckett's order to leave him behind on Hill 205 were not the only ones that night who placed the creed, their service to each other, above their very lives. The creed is more than an ethos. It is a way to live. It is also a way to die. It is an oath written in blood of how the American warrior will always prevail, always. As to the story of Colonel Ralph Puckett, Jr., the real question is what type of leader, what kind of man is he beyond the Battle of Hill 205? To tell that story, it started at the beginning. He was a newly graduated West Point lieutenant who had orders for the safety of Okinawa, but requested to be reassigned to Korea. Though an officer, he volunteered to be a squad leader when he learned that the 8th Army Ranger Company platoon leader's positions had already been filled by West Point classmates, nonetheless. He passed on being promoted to captain prior to Hill 205 because he believed it would create friction with his fellow lieutenants. Having suffered serious wounds in Hill 205, that almost led to his right foot being amputated, Lieutenant Puckett was offered a medical discharge but refused to accept it, working hard to retain combat arms status. As a Ranger advisor to Columbia, Captain Puckett extended his tour an additional six months, doubling his time of separation with his wife and newborn daughter to ensure the establishment of his prestigious School of Lancers, a South American Ranger School equivalent. In 1967, though he, would not have been assigned, he could have been assigned elsewhere, Lieutenant Colonel Puckett volunteered for a combat tour in Vietnam, where he assumed command of the 2nd Battalion, 502nd Infantry Regiment, Airborne. Infantry Battalion, I'm sorry. It, I stand correct. My apologies, sir. 2nd Battalion, 502nd Infantry Regiment, Airborne, 101st Airborne Division. Assigned the moniker Ranger by the Assistant Division Commander, Colonel Puckett earned a second Distinguished Cross that August for his fearless and inspirational leadership when he air assaulted into a desperate company-level night-long firefight. A platoon leader preparing for a last stand battle would later comment on Lieutenant Colonel Puckett's effect on the besieged and utterly exalted soldiers. Quote, word of Colonel Puckett's arrival spread like wildfire. We all stiffened up and felt nothing bad could happen now because the Ranger was with us, unquote. Why did Colonel Puckett work so hard to convince his wife, Jeannie, that he needed to go to Vietnam? Because the federal was his duty and that his leadership would help save soldiers' lives. Those are just some of the big bullet highlights of Colonel Puckett's selfless service. His more subtle acts of nuance and integrity, he refused to wear the coveted CIB, Combat Infantry Badge, after the Battle of 205, even though he had commanded the Army's first Ranger Company since World War II and been awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. His rationale, he didn't have orders to wear it. He refused to wear the coveted Special Forces tab, identifying him as a Green Beret because he retired from active duty before the tab came into existence. Again, though earned, he didn't have orders. Having earned two of the U.S. Army's most sought-after identifiers, Colonel Puckett's character would not allow him to wear these badges without proper authorization. Amusing enough, such selflessness, such protocol, such decorum, 
even transcended Colonel, Puckles, P Colonel Puckett's personal transactions. Recently, when asked, asking his bride of 68 years, how did the Colonel propose to her? Jeannie's response was, I don't recall. I don't recall him proposing. He spent most of the time telling me why I shouldn't marry him. Colonel Puckett, by his own admission, was not a perfect person, a perfect leader, for he cites numerous occasions where, upon reflection, he would have acted differently. For we mere mortals, nice to know you're human, sir. So in the end, why is any of this relevant? Because it defines Colonel Ralph Puckett, Jr., who defines who he is, and it defines a standard of leadership that all leaders should try to emulate. That is not an opinion, it is a fact. It's a fact validated by six consecutive appointments over 12 years as the honorary colonel of the 75th Ranger Regiment, an appointment that had been chartered by the Army Chief of Staff to be just a one, two-year assignment. It's a fact validated by the nearly two dozen four-star generals and numerous command sergeants majors he served as counsel and mentor to over the years. It's a fact validated by the hundreds of rank and file soldiers who have all have a Colonel Puckett story. It's relevant because Colonel Puckett was all inclusive, a ranger who was mission focused. Though the Army had only been de uh, de desegregated by President Harry Truman two years prior, Lieutenant Puckett selected two African Americans to serve the 8th Army Ranger Company. Why? Because they met the standards and to quote, we were all Americans. The blow was the same color, red, unquote. Later, when women were authorized to attend the U.S. Army Ranger School, Colonel Puckett was one of the first to proclaim, if they meet the standards, they are Rangers. Truth be told, I said I wasn't going to do that. Truth be told, the name Puckett is synonymous with leader. Colonel Puckett will be the first to tell you that the Medal of Honor, this recognition, that he did not initiate, which he never saw for himself, which he told me to cease work on at least three occasions, is, is not his alone. As with any team, there is no one individual who can do it all. By his own admission, Colonel Puckett is just a token representative of those great Americans of the 8th Army Ranger Company he was honored and privileged to command that fateful night. For those who know Colonel Puckett, there is nothing about his actions on Hill 205 that surprise you. You know, this is not a singular incident, a moment of courage. His actions were not something he did in the heat of combat. It is simply who he is. It was literally, as one ranger so succinctly put it, Ralph being Ralph. In closing, I believe General Stan McChrystal, a former 75th Ranger Regiment commander, said it more eloquently than I could. Quote, it doesn't take another medal to make you a hero in the eyes of every soldier who has had the pleasure and honor of knowing you, in or out of uniform. But that said, this is the right recognition for the right soldier. Unquote. The Korean conflict is known as the Forgotten War. While that may be, while that may be forgotten no longer are Colonel Puckett and his Rangers of the 8th Army Company, and 8th Army Ranger Company. And now, if I may, sir, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I'm glad that you're here. I appreciate you coming. I was asked to make a speech, but I said I will not make a formal speech, but I will make some comments which I'd like for you to hear about those rangers and the outstanding job that they did. Something I want to emphasize right at the beginning is <clears throat> those 73 individuals who joined and later 63 who finished the five weeks of training that we had were not special soldiers. They were not infantry trained. They were good soldiers but had not been trained as combat instrument. So we had a great job of staring us in the face is to turn them and to me and the other two lieutenants into qualified infantry commanders. We knew that we had tough battles ahead of us. We knew that success or failure would depend on how well we trained and how well we fought and how determined we fought. We were determined that we would do the best that we could. We were convinced that we would be ad adequate. At this time of year, cold winter, I often turn my mind to George Washington, my favorite American. And one of the things that happened to him at the beginning of the war, the revolution, it's one of my favorite stories of him and it occurred in 
1775 at Valley Forge. The day was bitter cold. Many of the men had never seen that cold before. It was terrible. They had suffered great hardships up until that day, and they were ready to go home. They had only one more day, and they'd be home. They knew something was up. As the, as the soldiers assembled, they could see General Washington astride his horse off to the side. They knew something was up. George Washington rode to the center of line and spoke to his assembled soldiers, telling them why they were still needed when the war was not yet over. He told them how proud he was of their victory, but he urged them, begged them, to volunteer to stay one month longer. Then he turned to the side and rode again. He rode to the center of the, off to the side where he had started, and he stood there for a moment as the regimental officers asked the soldiers to volunteer. Not one man moved. They were embarrassed. They knew how much Washington depended on them. They knew that without them, the war was over. They were it. They were the army of our country. And they would be disbanded tomorrow morning. They knew the pressure that was on them. They could see Washington off to the side. And the soldiers knew something was up. Was up. Washington listened to, or the soldiers listened to what Washington had to say and how much he depended on them. And then Washington strode to the side of Strider's horse and listened to the soldiers. They said nothing. They were embarrassed. These are the soldiers that had won our choir, won our freedom. And they'd done it for our founding fathers to create our Constitution and form our democracy. For more than 200 years, citizens, soldiers, and others have volunteered and fought and died to protect that freedom and maintain it for us. While we have many enemies of this country today who want to see us fall, there's no greater enemy, in my opinion, than ourselves. We've divided ourselves into tribes and have closed our ears to all who would not think that we would do what we needed to do. Our enemies outside our country are aiding and abetting the dissension within our ranks. They're watching with satisfaction as they see us destroying ourselves. Our politicians in Congress have together sworn an oath to protect our democracy and have put their self-interest ahead of their sworn, sworn oath. Our country was not created to be the states of America, but rather we were named United States of America. It's my hope that all Americans will come to think about that and adapt that to their own thought process, to their own belief system. Our country depends on you, you, me. What you do every day and how you live. Without you, we will not maintain our freedom. It depends on us. Abraham Lincoln, warned us a house divided against itself cannot stand. We know that we have to come together and fight together as the United States of America in order to survive as a free nation. Thank you for coming here today. Mr. Merle Simpson. Merle Simpson. I'm a member of Ralph's Rangers. I'm one of the originals. 
when that started. I have uh, live in Indiana. I have three sons and daughter. My son Don brought me. I have known Ralph since the first day that he interviewed me. And I have never seen a better man than Ralph Beckett. That's it. Hi, I'm Rob Choppa. I'm a retired Army colonel, and I'm proud to be Ralph Puckett's ranger buddy for the last couple of years. We've gone and seen lots of training and met with his rangers as well as other officers and soldiers in our Army. And the one message that Ralph has always encouraged is for everyone to be better. Think about what you did, identify the challenges, and be better. And that defines Ralph Puckett. Thank you, gentlemen of the uh, panel. We will now begin taking your questions, beginning with uh, Dan Lamoth from Washington Post. Yes, thanks for your time. Uh, I was interested if, if you could walk us through the, uh, the journey here uh, in terms of, I, I know it took multiple years, multiple efforts, and there's been a long waiting period. Um, how did that feel? How did that seem? And what did it take to get to where you are now? Thanks. Me? <laughs> how you doing, Dan? Uh, it, obviously, it's been an 18-year journey uh, to get to this point. Uh, the interesting thing about it is that had we gotten here or not, it really didn't make a difference in terms of the man we're talking about. You know, the Medal of Honor uh, is quite obviously an amazing uh, recognition of one's courage and valor. As the Colonel himself has indicated each and every time, it is just a representation of the soldiers that he led on the hilltop that night. Um, but uh, all of us who know him, just as I said with uh, General McChrystal's uh, quote, everybody up here, that uh, whether the medal were placed around his neck tomorrow or not, uh, it doesn't make a difference in terms of how we see him, how we see the couple of Colonel Puckett and Jeannie. Uh, truly an exemplary uh, example for all of us try to aspire to be. And the fact that it took 18 years, uh, I'm just glad we did it. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Chuck Williams from WRBL, Columbus, Georgia. that our country has survived those many years. We've survived by luck. we survived by good fortune. we survived because the good Lord gave us that privilege. And we survived because there are some great men who gave everything to defend and win the freedom for our country, for you and me, and for all of us who come after them. We owe it to those soldiers, those people who volunteered at the beginning. Nobody, in my opinion, would have really given much credence to the idea that a motley group of farmers, and people like that we had in the volunteer army, could have beaten Great Britain. It was the greatest power on earth. George Washington was no qualified leader. He had little or no experience. Yet he had volunteered to take command of our forces 
farmers, traders, volunteered to take command of those forces and lead them against the British in a fight for freedom. Washington probably was the only man who could have done that. He was amazing. He never gave up. When things were the toughest, George Washington was there, and he did it. He led the way. George Washington was as best as he come. Although he was brand new, he gave everything that he had to train and to lead his soldiers in the fight for our freedom. George Washington is my favorite hero because of the man that he was, the soldier and leader that he was, and all that he did for our country. Thank you, sir. Next, we have uh, Steve Benyon from Military.com. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Colonel, for uh, for uh, doing this roundtable with us. Um, when you think about the other guys you served with that, of course, did heroic actions, how do you look at the Medal of Honor and, and you awarding it, and uh, what do you think about the guys you served with who uh, did make it? What they, what they were saying, kind of how you want to carry that legacy forward. Steve, 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 can you go ahead and uh, repeat the question? You had some uh, feedback in your phone. Go ahead and uh, go ahead with your question again. Okay, while we. Uh, we get Steve back on the line. Uh, let's go ahead and go to Davis Winky from Army Times. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you, Colonel Pocket, for taking the time to do this. And um, the question I have is for him and for other members of the team. What did it feel like to receive the call confirming? that this was going to happen, that 18 years of effort was going to pay off like this. Ralph, the question was, when you received the call from the President of the United States, what was it like? What did you feel? It was quite a shock. I was surprised that I had received a call from the, pre from the President. I never thought he'd be calling to speak to me. I was surprised by how humble and ordinary friendly that he sounded. But my wife, I'd like for her to describe the conversation that she had with the president <laughs> because she expresses it best. And she expresses exactly the way I felt about the president when he spoke to me. This is a man that's leading our country. I think I can depend on him. So can you. Will you give us a few words? No? Okay. That's the way it is with my family. <laughs> the man of the house is supposed to be the leader, but he's just there. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you, Colonel Puckett. I just want to remind everybody that's on the line to please re uh, remember to mute your phones if you're not uh, speaking. Uh, let's go ahead and go back to uh, Steve Benyon at military.com. Uh, yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we got you. Yeah, uh, Colonel, I, pre I appreciate you uh, taking the time out today. Um, how do you feel about just the gravity of getting the medal and, and how do you look at that um, legacy and what do you think the guys you worked with uh, in Korea and Vietnam would think? I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get the question. How do you think about the gravity of this medal, the, the importance it has and, and what the men feel like in your unit about this award? Well, what, what the gravity of this mes mes message is well, it's certainly the most important mess, mess medal that we have in our country. And I certainly am honored to be the recipient. The people and it's people who have earned that medal in the 8th Army Ranger Company are the Rangers, like Bill Simpson, 
who did more than I asked to do the best that they could in order to maintain our freedom. I think it's important to them. I want them to know that they're the ones who did the job. They did the risk. They did the fighting. They suffered the wounds. They suffered the deaths. They're the ones who deserve the credit, and I hope that they can get that. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we have Jeremy Redman from the Atlanta Journal. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Colonel. Congratulations on this honor, and thank you for doing this call. Earlier today, I was at Fort Stewart reporting on the 3rd Infantry Division honoring Sergeant First Class Paul Wayne Cash, who has um, been approved for a Medal of Honor, has yet to receive it, and he has um, been recognized for saving uh, several soldiers from a burning Bradley fighting vehicle that was hit by an active in Iraq in 2005. I'm curious, familiar you know your your Was that a question? Uh, if the audio is very bad, but I think it's... Jeremy, we, we caught about half of your question. Can you just, can you go back and give that one again? Um, it was, it was a little low. Just go ahead and speak up a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, earlier today, the 3rd Infantry Division at Fort Stewart honored Sergeant First Class Paulwyn Cash by honoring the Memorial Garden after him. He comes for a state medal of honor, and it's for saving several soldiers from a burning Bradley fighting vehicle that was hit by an IED in Iraq in 2005. I'm curious if you're familiar with this story, and I'd like to hear your thoughts about it. This is Rob Choppa. We are proud that Sergeant First Class Cash represents the state of Georgia and the, in the city of Columbus, and we're certainly looking forward to his ceremony um, when, when he is, and his family are presented the Medal of Honor. He brought great credit to the 3rd Infantry Division, and his heroics will go down in history. Uh, just as a reminder of that, that all, uh, all Medal of Honor decisions are pre-decisional, and it is uh, by the White House. Uh, is there anybody that uh, has a follow-up question as of right now that I did not get to? Um, please try not to step on each other. Okay, since we have no more questions, is there anything else that uh, anybody would like to say as members of the panel? So thank, you. thank you for coming. Support our soldiers. The only thing I, I want to add is Ralph's entire family is here with him, and they've been instrumental in his life and his successful Army career and everything he's done after the Army. Um, it is truly a Team Puckett effort, and we're all proud to be here with him, and we're thrilled about tomorrow's ceremony. So Jeannie, Marty, Thomas, and all the grandkids, thank you all for, for being part of Ralph and, and his legacy. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you to the members of the panel for sharing your time and your stories. Uh, this ends our media roundtable. If you have uh, any follow-up questions, uh, please do not hesitate to contact me, Sergeant First Class Anthony Hewitt, Army Public Affairs, or our Office for Assistance. This concludes today's media roundtable. Thank you.